morning, everyone. Um, I'm about to uh, call this uh, meeting to order in advance. I just want to apologize to everyone for the uh, close quarters. I know everybody's a little claustrophobic and would like a little bit more space. Um, we uh, moved uh, back uh, several months ago to a new building, and it's a great building for us to get our work done in, but the one fallback is we don't have our own boardroom, so we're at the whim of open spaces to hold hearings at and in this particular case the larger room across the hall which we will be in tomorrow is not available today so um, hopefully everybody will get to know their neighbor and uh, <laughs> be polite um, and at the beginning i'm going to um, ask anyone that has not signed in that wishes to um, testify at the end of the day to please sign in with agatha at the back of the room and do we have a general sign-in for who's here, Agatha? Uh, no, we don't. Should we? We should. That so why don't you have a uh, pad passed around the room so we can get everybody to sign in? Yeah. Okay. Um, with that, um, I am going to turn this hearing over to our hearing officer for today, Judy Hankin, and Judy will be running the uh, day's proceedings. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Judy Henkin. I'm going to be hearing officer by designation of the board chair, as you just heard, July 23rd, 2008. This is docket number GMCB 0918 rate review. If you have a cell phone, can you please turn off the sound now so I don't have to um, look at you with a glare at you later? Um, we have Blue Cross here today. It's the first day of two days of hearing. Uh, Jacqueline Hughes is Jackie Hughes. I'll go by Jackie. You don't have to go by Judith. <laughs> is representing um, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. We're doing a little bit of a um, different setup for their witnesses today. If you've been here in the past, we are going to have all four of their witnesses sit at the witness table together, and that way the board and um, the HCA can ask questions as a, uh, a panel. We've in the past had to call people back because it was the inappropriate witness for the question that was asked. This should make our time more efficient. We're going to try to be efficient today. Also, we have a long day um, ahead. Blue Cross will be taking up most of the morning, if not all of the morning, with their witnesses, with the cross-examination, and with questioning from the board members. We have a court reporter here today. Wait, you're over here. I'm sorry. So this will be transcribed, and we'll be um, asking for an ex expedited um, transcription of this. So that will be done, and it will be posted to the website after it's done. The board has jurisdiction over this matter under Title 18, Section 9375B6. Title 8, Section 4062A, that deals with rate review, and Title 8, uh, Section 4512, that's specific for Blue Cross. I want to welcome everyone. It's going to be a little warm in here, and it's a little bit of an intimate setting for um, this hearing, but welcome. If you are here to comment, there is a sign-up sheet. We will be taking comment at whatever time the hearing evidence is concluded, so I don't have a time certain for that. Over at, and tomorrow night there is also public hearing from uh, beginning at 4.30. I believe we have a 6.30 stop, but we will try to get everyone accommodated. I know that's been pretty widely disseminated for that public comment period, period, and it's at City Hall tomorrow night. Written public comments are also being accepted till I believe the 28th. The HCA is here today, the Office of Healthcare Advocate, and we have a new face on the panel here. Uh, Jay Enghoff is here representing Agnoff. Sorry. No, Enghoff. Enghoff? Is that misspelled? I thought it was Enghoff, and then I read it. <laughs> yes, it is misspelled. <laughs> well, I'll just change my name. <laughs> so, I looked at that, and I, I said, boy, I'm wrong. I had that wrong all along. Thank you. So, um, Jay is here today. <laughs> Healthcare Advocates Office, and he is joined by Kelly Paper, whose name I'm sure I mispronounce every time I say it, and um, Eric Schulteis, whose name I think I'm getting right. <laughs> uh, Mike Fisher, the Chief Healthcare Advocate, is here at the table. 
with them also. I want to also remind the parties today and the board that there are confidential documents that are within this filing. The board has been privy to those because they are um, maybe material to a decision, but I do want to caution everyone when they are speaking about um, documents, they are clearly marked in the packets and um, to please be very aware and I'm going to also uh, state that to the witnesses. Um, I think at this time there are, um, if we can, I'll introduce also, we have um, our actuary will be testifying this afternoon and David Dillon from l &E is in the back of the room and we um, will have them testify. We also have the Department of Financial Regulation and the commissioner is here with their general counsel sitting in the front row and we'll hopefully get to them this morning but they will be um, presenting testimony after we hear from Blue Cross and get through that whole morning. While we're at it, if we can swear in all of today's witnesses at once so we get that completed, um, I'll ask the court reporter to please do that. Okay. I can do Whoever's that. Whoever's going to testify, please raise your right hands, please. Do you swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you that? I do. Thank you. So again, I want to talk about the procedure a little so everyone has this clear. We will have Blue Cross presenting first. After they present their direct testimony, the Office of Healthcare Advocate will have an opportunity to ask questions. The board will then have an opportunity to ask questions following the HCA. Um, after that, we will hear from the Department of Financial Regulation. We'll also have opportunities for the carrier, for the HCA, and the board to ask questions of the Department of Financial Regulation. The um, testimony from Lewis and Ellis, our actuary, uh, we will have our general counsel, who I have not introduced, who is at the table over here, not general counsel, he's our staff Stop attorney, <laughs> um, he's an assistant counsel here, um, Sebastian Arguango will be asking, uh, leading the direct for our actuary, and we will again allow for the HCA for the carrier to ask questions, and if the board has follow-up questions also, there will be time for that. And um, last will be the presentation by the HCA. I'd like to first, before we commence anything, deal with, um, there was a motion in this, and there was a motion um, concerning the testimony of Michael Fisher. There is an expert report that's at issue. It is an issue, and I will note, in both matters, the MVP and the Blue Cross, and uh, the same arguments were made concerning the admissibility of it. Um, in Blue Cross, I'm trying to look, was there a response to that, to the, to the motion um, at this no, point? We, we didn't file a written response. Blue Cross filed their motion, I believe, late Thursday night. We'd like to argue it now with your permission. I'll leave a few minutes for that um, and get that out of the way. So, uh, Jackie, I'll let you um, just briefly present what is in your motion, and um, it's a written motion. I have reviewed it. We have reviewed the other one. Do you have anything to add? I do have a couple things to add. One is to clear the air. Um, there was a press report on the motion that I think mischaracterized what the motion is all about. This hearing is a contested case and is the equivalent of a trial, but the board is the judge. The Vermont Rules of Evidence do apply to this proceeding, and our motion in Lemonade was squarely based on the technical rules of evidence that apply and addresses the question of whether certain testimony could probably be admitted as expert testimony under those rules. Our motion was not about whether the healthcare advocate should participate as a party and play their statutory role in the process. Our motion was not about whether the healthcare advocate can cross-examine our witnesses, can cross-examine the witness board, the Green Mountain Care Board, can cross-examine the commissioner. Um, and it's not about whether the healthcare advocate can, can advocate on behalf of consumers. Uh, it was noted earlier um, whether the Vermont Rules of Evidence permit the type of evidence the healthcare advocates sought to admit as evidence. However, the, however the Green Mountain Care Board rules, we respect the role of the healthcare advocate in this process and we're not trying to say that they are not a participant. Um, I, I believe my motion uh, fairly states our legal grounds. 
Um, there is one procedural ground that I mentioned in the motion but didn't highlight, and that is the fact that the, mo the uh, opinion was not signed. Uh, that was required under the scheduling order to be signed, and it was not. And so I add that as another procedural ground. And that was in the, that was in your written motion, yes. if I recall. Mr. Engel. Uh, Madam Hearing Officer and uh, Mr. Chair and members, we're surprised at the opposition to this. It's not that earth-shattering. The case is not going to rise or fall, with all due respect, on Mr. Fisher's testimony. But we believe that Mr. Fisher, even if this were a federal court proceeding under the technical rules of evidence, would be permitted to testify. But let me be clear, this is not a federal court proceeding. This is an administrative proceeding. In a federal court, you don't have four people at, at a, as a panel uh, responding to questions. And this, uh, this body has its own rules. And one rule is that evidence is admissible if it's of the type commonly relied upon by reasonable, prudent people in the conduct of their affairs. I'd like to think that anyone would agree that Mr. Fisher's testimony does fit that rule. In addition, the statute expressly gives the public advocate, uh, I'm sorry, the health care advocate, the right to testify at this proceeding. So we think that it's allowed under the technical rules that would apply in federal court. Even if it's not, it's clearly allowed under the rules that apply here. And number, th number three, the statute expressly gives the uh, health care advocate the right to testify at this proceeding. So we think that the motion should be denied. I have reviewed the law on this, and, and uh, we did receive this early enough and have noticed that this was an issue of the case. And um, I recognize there's an important role for the health care advocate in this proceeding. It is provided for in statute. It is provided for um, in our rule. They are um, an, an integral part of this proceeding in providing their, um, in participating by suggesting questions. They are allowed to provide a public comment under Section 4. 462 of Title VIII. They are a party in the proceeding. However, that doesn't confer um, expert status to their witness in this instance. The um, document that was provided by the healthcare advocate is, in its essence, um, not based on any type of technical or um, other expertise of Mr. Fisher as a legislator. It is a recitation of his recollection and his, his research into the legislative history of Act 48, um, and it doesn't involve specialized knowledge for what he has provided there and um, would not be anything that adds to the case or the evidence or a fact at issue. It's well settled law that the opinion of one legislator is not representative of the legislative intent of the statute. Um, the board does have the opportunity to look at legislative history and look at um, and do research behind the act. However, um, here the the gist and the core of what was provided is that the concepts of the review standards of affordability, access to care, and quality of care are separate and distinct from the actuarial standards. It does not appear in dispute that they're not. Those are expressly provided for in the statute. The legislature did put those into the statute as a separate requirement. They're part of the rule. And um, based on the plain language of the statute, um, those do not need additional construction through um, a le the legislative research that was provided by the healthcare advocate. Um, and the response in the MVP, I believe, was that these do have some meaning. I don't believe that um, that will need, uh, the terms were inserted advisedly into the statute, that's the presumption. So yes, they would have some meaning. So the, I have looked at Rule 702, we looked at our rules. Um, this is patently inadmissible as an expert statement, so we are going to exclude that from the hearing and the related testimony. 
May Mr. Fisher then testify as a fact witness, not as an expert witness, but simply describing what he saw as uh, as a fact witness. Um, what he saw the legislature um, would no not be that is what was in the the expert testimony. So um, the opinion of one legislator is not representative of the intent behind the statute. I don't think that there is much in what was written that is necessarily um, not open to inclusion in your memorandum that follows. There's a lot of legal construction of an ultimate conclusion of law that the board was going to make, but I do not believe that that is something that Mr. Fisher should be allowed to testify at, and I'm going to exclude that testimony. Moving on, we have um, stipulated to materials. I believe everyone um, here has a similar binder, but there were some materials that were not included. We had a late amendment from Blue Cross, and I do not believe that's been put into the binders, and I, I'd like um, Blue Cross to please explain that um, what's going on, if that's been discussed, because it is part of your filing. Right. Uh, we did not put it into, my, in, into the binder because the binder only includes matters that have been stipulated that can be admitted into evidence. And I have asked the health care advocate's office whether they would stipulate to it. Um, they said they didn't have an adequate opportunity to review it yet. Um, but we fully intend to present it as part of our um, case today. So. Uh, we did not, we didn't presume to put it in the binder without actually being uh, stipulated to it. But you will offer that into evidence? Yes, we will. And we have copies here if, in fact, that you have enough copies we have for copies. everyone. <laughs> All right, uh, we will get going then without much more discussion here. Any other preliminary issues that we need to review? I would allow both parties. I believe there is one other, um, okay. and that is the parties have worked to um, develop a list of things, facts that can be administratively noticed. Uh, yes. I believe there was a letter that was filed last night uh, by um, part of the HCA team. Um, the letter, though, did not have the attached documents, um, and so we would like the opportunity, there was um, at least one, uh, where we want to have the opportunity to look at the final document. Uh, we agree in principle that all of those things can be noticed by the board. They may take administrative notice, um, and I will let the health care advocate argue why they should be administratively noticed. Uh, but I did want to point out the fact that um, there is, I think, sort of a technical glitch in that we don't have the final documents that will be uh, provided to the board. And we did have a discussion before um, about putting together all the um, actual documents or links to them. I want to at least say right now that the stipulated exhibit list, um, these are exhibits 1 through 16 are entered into evidence, so they do not have to be entered in singular, singularly. And I also want to point out that um, I did receive that list of documents, and my understanding is they are, in fact, stipulated to as far as they can. we can take administrative notice of those. Is that correct? Uh, you may if the health care advocate convinces you that they are relevant and meet other standards. Yes. Uh, and, and I'll go back. And my understanding was we did have this discussion earlier that the carrier did not oppose the board taking administrative notice of those at this time. We do not. We do not. Okay. And we have reviewed the list, and the board will take administrative notice of all of those items. So those do not have to be, again, individually discussed and, and debated at this point. I'll allow each party to do a brief opening statement before we get to the first witness. Great, thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, as Judy said earlier, I am Jackie Hughes, and I'm here representing Blue Cross Blue Shield. This is Blue Cross's sixth uh, individual and small group rate filing, uh, formerly known as the QHP rate filing. Um, we, as a healthcare advocate, uh, have stipulated to the admission of the uh, materials that you found in your binder, the finding the binder. Um, and this year, um, exhibits two through 12 um, display the broadest list of questions that we've received to date on any of our filings. 
Um, and time constraints will not permit us to go through all of those, so we have to rely on you to have reviewed them and, um, and absorb them. Uh, in this hearing, we plan to highlight some of our content, the contents of our filing, but not necessarily uh, each and every piece of it. Um, we will also present an amendment to our filing that was filed last week. We don't normally file amendments, uh, but this year several, several events made it clear to us that we must in order to fully fund the 2019 rates. We will highlight important solvency concerns that are applicable to Blue Cross, as well as uh, the multifaceted operational realities of our business. Blue Cross has long been an active participant in Vermont's individual and small group markets. In some years and in some markets, we've been the only participant. Blue Cross has also actively collaborated on state re health reform initiatives starting more than two decades ago that promote the public's access to affordable, high quality health benefits. And in some of those initiatives, We've been the only non-government participant, and we've taken on a disproportionate share of the burden. This filing reflects our holistic efforts to transform Vermont's health delivery system to one in which every Vermonter has health care coverage and receives timely, effective, and affordable care. In order to support our efforts, we need to be able to invest in health care reform initiatives with some investments seeing no return on investment and others with long delayed or dis disappointingly low returns. If Blue Cross is crippled in its health reform efforts due to lack of investment capital, health care in this state, we believe, will become less affordable, less accessible, and of lower quality. Everyone wants health care that is high quality, accessible when needed, and affordable and the very difficult and complex work required to make the cost of health benefits and therefore the rates more affordable cannot be done by Blue Cross alone. Nor does it make long-term or short-term sense to deplete Blue Cross's financial position to the point that it can no longer afford to protect its members from financial ruin when they need health services. That is the trajectory we are currently on, and despite that, we remain committed to this market. <coughs> The rates we present here for the 2019 benefit packages reflect the product of Vermont consumer protections and health care reforms to date, together with the associated savings and costs that go along with those. The rates also reflect the many millions of dollars of annual savings achieved by Blue Cross through its own care management and reform initiatives. We, we do thank Dave Dillon and the, the team at l &E, uh, for their efforts to conduct a thorough review of the filing. Uh, once again, l &E's opinion makes clear that Blue Cross has developed rates applying rigorous actuarial standards so that the requested rates are adequate, but not excessive or unfairly discriminatory. And I realize l &E has not yet looked at the amendment and passed judgment on it, but their original uh, opinion does confirm that our original filing meets those standards. Our approach, however, is not just to meet the actuarial standards. It is to meet all the standards. Our filings have always been about meeting all of the standards. The filing <coughs> supports our payment obligations for necessary health services that are of high quality and to provide access for our members at the right time in the right amount and in the right place while being as affordable as the various mandates and other requirements allow. The rates are designed to allow us to pay for the increased costs and the increased utilization of the provider services, hospital stays, prescription drugs, and other medical supplies and equipment which comprise over 90 cents of every premium dollar. The filing as amended will produce rates that are reasonable in relation to the benefits that are to be provided in 2019 while not being inadequate, excessive, or unfairly discriminatory. We also thank Commissioner Pichek for his solvency report and the sense of urgency it conveys. The board's decisions over the last few years have taken Blue Cross in an unsustainable direction financially. 
We do not agree with that direction, and we think the rate approved by the board should cover the expected cost of the medical care and drugs that we pay for on behalf of our members. The rate should also cover the taxes and the fees that will be paid, and they must also cover the cost to administer the plans. That means adjudicating, processing, and paying the millions of claims we receive each year to help providers manage our members' care, to help our members access timely and effective care, to assure that care delivered meets high quality standards, and to provide for the maintenance of the policyholders' reserve fund. This reserve fund is for member protection. It allows Blue Cross to make investments in healthcare reform, it allows Blue Cross to keep pace with technological challenges and that we face while also allowing us to meet the unexpected events which have and will continue to occur. It bears repeating, underfunding Blue Cross's rates is not payment reform and it is not cost containment. It just and it does not make the rates more affordable. It simply postpones the day of reckoning and hampers Blue Cross's ability to engage in health care payment reform with other interested parties, including the board. Finally, during this hearing, we will present the board with the evidence and support for what it is going to take for Blue Cross to have adequate funding to deliver the 2019 plans for tens of thousands of Vermonters. We hope the board can see its way clear to give Blue Cross a rate that will allow it to continue to serve in this market. Thank you. Mr. Angle. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Jay Angoff. I'm with the law firm of Miriam Scallett in Washington, D.C. I represent the Healthcare Advocates Office. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here today. We don't believe that Blue Cross has carried the burden that is entitled to this increase or any increase under the controlling statute. And we'll be questioning Mr. Uh, the the uh, Blue Cross actuary and others and going into a lot of detail. Hopefully, uh, it won't put you to sleep, but we'll be, we, we'll be going into, into a lot of issues. But let me just address three right now. First, and most significant, is the windfall that Blue Cross gets this year, and next year, and next year, and the year after that, under the Trump tax bill. I've got a particular interest in this law because the Trump tax bill raises my taxes. I live in one of those high-cost Maryland suburbs, and there's a cap on local, state and local taxes, so it raises my taxes, but it gives Blue Cross a tremendous windfall. Blue Cross gets $16 million back in 2019 as a result of the Trump tax bill making the taxes that Blue Cross has paid for about the last 20 years refundable. In addition, the tax bill, which is called the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, also eliminates Blue Cross's obligation to pay federal taxes in the future, not just this year, but forever and ever. Now, I'll be questioning uh, the Blue Cross Actuary about Exhibit 5 in their uh, rate filing. And Exhibit 5 goes through all the provisions that raise, in Blue Cross's estimation, that Blue Cross thinks are going to raise the amount it's going to have to pay out next year. Those are estimates. Some we agree with, some we, some we think are reasonable, some we think aren't. But on the one hand, Blue Cross includes what it thinks it will have to pay out next year and it totally disregards what it's getting back from the Trump tax bill. You, you don't see that any place in Exhibit 5. So it's all one-way stuff. They, they, they raise their rates because of things they think are going to happen next year. They don't know, but they think. But they refuse to reduce their rates, not just based on a projection, but based on actual money that they know is being returned. So that's number one. That's what I think the board should really focus on. Number two. And I have a little sympathy for Blue Cross on this issue, not on the Trump tax bill issue, but on this issue. Blue Cross has always taken the position that they're just a passive price taker, that whatever the hospitals say the rate is, the rate is, and they don't negotiate. And it's true, obviously, Vermont's a small state, the hospitals have market power, but Blue Cross has market power. Blue Cross is the dominant insurer by far in the state. 
Hospitals cannot afford to do business if they don't accept Blue Cross insured patients. So we think Blue Cross can do more. I know that the board, I think quite correctly, has put in previous orders that we expect, we reasonably expect Blue Cross to be tougher with the hospitals. The board's absolutely right about that. But I think the board is, should consider at least doing a little more than just than saying we expect and actually reducing the rate, not a lot, but reducing the rate some in order to really give Blue Cross an incentive to get tough with the hospitals. It's a cost plus percentage of cost business. It's really in Blue Cross's economic interest, as ironic as it might seem, to have costs be a little higher because 2% of $100 is less than 2% of $101. So the higher the underlying costs are, the more Blue Cross makes. They need a real incentive to cut those, to, to get really to negotiate more stringently with the hospitals. Third, Blue Cross reads the term affordable and the term quality of care and the term promote access to health care out of the statute. Blue Cross's actuary says that the rate is not excessive, inadequate, or unfairly discriminatory. We disagree with that, and we think we've got a compelling case will show why that is not the case. We think that the rate is excessive. But let's assume that Blue Cross is right, that their, their actuary is right. In most states, in virtually all states, that's enough. I used to be the insurance commissioner of Missouri, and in Missouri, like almost all other states, the test, the only test is for whether or not a rate is lawful, is, is it excessive, inadequate, or unfairly discriminatory? And if the company can come in and demonstrate that it's not excessive, inadequate, or unfairly discriminatory, the rate is lawful. So Blue Cross would be right if they were in any other state. But Vermont is different. The Vermont statute says that you all must determine that rate not just is not excessive, un unfair, not excessive, inadequate or unfairly discriminatory, but you've also got to, to determine whether or not it's affordable, whether or not it promotes quality of care, whether or not it promotes access to care. And Blue Cross's actuary uh, doesn't do that. Blue Cross doesn't carry the burden on that, and I'm not blaming Blue Cross's actuary. That's not what an actuary is trained to do. But Blue Cross has not submitted any evidence demonstrating that this rate, the proposed rate, is affordable. So I just, those are three issues which we'll get into in the cross-examination period. There are many more, but uh, based on that, we don't think Blue Cross has carried the burden, carried its burden. And then I, uh, finally, just two points, two more points. One, the Blue Cross amendment to the filing was filed, and we got notice of it, at 6.46 p.m. on Wednesday. Blue Cross filed, in this case, on May 11th. There was no reason that Blue Cross could not have amended this much earlier. Even if they could have amended this earlier, it's unfair to us, much more important, it's unfair to you, and most important of all, it's unfair to the people of Vermont for Blue Cross to come in two days before the hearing and say, oh yeah, you know, we're asking for another two and a half percent. So I don't think it's proper to consider that, uh, that amendment, and we, re we recommend that the, uh, committee reject that the board reject that. And then finally, let's not forget the Blue Cross statute, the Enabling Act. Blue Cross has an obligation under the statute to provide insurance at minimum cost under efficient and economical management. MVP doesn't have that obligation. Blue Cross does. It says they've got to provide insurance at minimum cost, not at uh, some point in the midpoint of an actuarial range, but at minimum cost. So uh, Blue Cross is in a unique position. They haven't carried their burden. And we, uh, we asked the, uh, and we'll show during, the, uh, during this hearing that Blue Cross is not entitled to the uh, rate increase they propose. Thank you. Thank you. You can call your first witness. Great. Um, I call Paul Schultz, Ruth Green, Josh Clavin and Andrew Garden. No. Witnesses. And everyone has um, taken their oath. Yes. And again, we apologize for the lack of table space. 
Yes, I am. I also uh, supervise the preparation of that amendment. And would you describe the contents of the amendment? Yes, so we, we actually started with the uh, Lewis and Ellis recommendations, which we did not oppose. So that formed the starting point of our amendment. Uh, from there, we added the cost of two new Vermont state laws that impact 2019 benefits, one having to do with chiropractic co-pays, the other having to do with breast imaging. Um, that, those two things combined added an average of about 0.1% to rates, not a huge amount. Uh, we then layered on top of that a uh, 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 factor for association health plans. Uh, we do expect there to be a pretty significant migration of small groups from qualified health plans <laughs> to association health plans in 2019 because of these recently released federal and expected state rules. Um, those changes increased the, the rate by about 2.1% on average. And does this amendment include any change uh, for the recent federal actions regarding the risk adjustment program that's being headlined in the news? Uh, uh, no, there's nothing in the amendment for that. We, the, so the federal government has suspended payment of risk adjustment amounts for 2017, and that's expected to, to impact 2018 as well. However, we do not believe that will have any impact on 2019 risk adjustment. Therefore, we did not include anything in the amendments for that. So I'm going to show you what has been marked Exhibit 17 for the record. Can you identify for the record uh, what Exhibit 17 is? Uh, that is the uh, rate amendment that I just uh, summarized at a high level. And was this amendment provided to the board, to Lewis and Ellis, and Council for the Healthcare Advocate on July 18th? Yes, that's right. And was that the first that the Healthcare Advocate knew that we were interested in providing an amendment? Um, I, I honestly, I don't know the answer to that. So I move for admission of Exhibit 17 into the record. Mr. Hancock. Uh, we, we object. We think it's improper. We, uh, if it is going to be admitted, we would, we would ask for a substantial extension of all the deadlines so that we can review it and challenge it. I have reviewed the document and the justification for the document as to the um, timeliness of the information and the timing of the filing of the initial um, the initial rates through SERF. Going to admit the document. I do understand not only has um, the HCA not had the opportunity to really review the document, the board members have not, our actuary has not. We do have a provision that allows for up to 30 additional days for the board's decision. We, this hearing today, we will um, leave this, oh, this issue open while we await some responses from the carrier on the amendment. We can discuss it today, and if we have to reopen this hearing for um, open discussion, we will do that also. But we do have up to an additional 30 days, and I'm not going to extend any deadlines at this moment, and we will discuss that at the end of today's testimony. Thank you. So uh, exhibit number 17 of Blue Cross is admitted into evidence. Just some light reading. So, Mr. Schultz, in your professional opinion, was this amendment necessary? Yes, it was, uh, because of subsequent actions taken by the Vermont legislature and also the subsequent regulation that was released by the federal government and is anticipated to be released by DFR. This amendment was necessary um, to meet with all of the, the rules um, around this rate filing. Specifically, rates would have been inadequate in the absence of this amendment. 
So as you developed the filing and the amendment, um, what was Blue Cross's objective? Our objective was to return a contribution to member reserves of our target of 1.5%. Um, and to do that while using actuarial assumptions that are reasonable both individually and in the aggregate, and also in complying with all state and federal uh, regulations and rules. Uh, now, I want to expand on that a little bit. Uh, I want to make it clear so we've talked about ranges of reasonable assumptions. I want to make it clear we are not filing at the high end of the range of reasonable assumptions. We are not filing to try to recover the CSR dollars that were defunded in late 2017 and through 2018. Uh, those are in the past. None of that is part of this rate filing. We are filing for a 1.5% contribution to reserves, which is the amount that's necessary to maintain reserves at an adequate but modest level of solvency that our solvency regulator has insisted that we maintain. So can you give us an overview of the assumptions other than trend that, that went into the filing and the subsequent amendment? Yes, there are a number of those. So I'll, I'll start with uh, population changes, and that had a number of component parts. There was a very small change uh, for newly insured members. Uh, there was a much larger adjustment for members who left us from 2017 to 2018. There was a fairly significant migration away from Blue Cross. Um, and it turns out that the healthier members are the ones who left us. And so that has an increase on our claims cost. That increase was almost perfectly offset by an expected increase in risk adjustment receivable. So, uh, additionally, um, we took a look at continuing members. And for continuing members, we've observed over time that the risk pool, the, the single risk pool in Vermont, has been aging at a pace that adds about a half percent per year to claim costs. And so we reflected that um, in our assumptions. And finally, we include an assumption for selection, which is members make, tend to make financial decisions that are in their best interest. Um, we need to reflect that in our rates. So all those assumptions are in there. Beyond that, we had to make assumptions for a number of new federal regulations. The first of those, I mentioned the defunding of CSR uh, benefits, which are cost share reductions available to low-income Vermonters. The federal government no longer funds those. In response, Vermont uh, passed what we refer to colloquially as our, as our silver solution. Uh, so we are loading the silver on exchange plans with the cost of those CSR benefits. Premiums are higher for those plans, but members in those plans are protected from the premium increases because the, the, the federal premium subsidies will increase at the same pace. Um, we also have now silver reflective plans, which are off exchange plans that look almost exactly the same as the on exchange plans, but are available at rates that are, that are more um, uh, coordinated with, with what the rates have been in the past. So they don't include the cost of those CSR benefits. Because of all these changes, we needed to include assumptions as to how members would migrate from plans that are becoming silver loaded into some of these other plans, whether that's reflective plans or they might stay on the exchange and instead choose a bronze plan for a lot less money or a gold plan that'll have it really close to the same price tag as a silver plan. So there'll be a lot of membership movement. We had to, we had to reflect that. Um, Additionally, um, the, federal, or the federal government also had a, a couple other things. I mentioned AHPs. That's part of our amendment um, for association health plans. Uh, as of 2014, Vermont decided, I'm sorry, Vermont decided that as of 2014, associations would no longer be able to help offer health plans to small groups. Small groups could only purchase insurance through the exchange. Uh, recently, federal regulations have kind of changed that paradigm. They've stated that uh, small groups who band together in an association can be treated like a large group for rating purposes. Um, so with that new regulation, a number of associations who used to offer health plans prior to 2014 and have continued to operate, that continue to exist as associations to offer many other benefits other than health benefits to their employer members, um, they've approached us with an expressed great interest in getting back into the health benefit market. They want to offer these association health plans starting in 2019. 
Uh, so our sales department worked with these associations to develop uh, reasonable membership assumptions uh, based on expected, my, expected uh, pricing differential between qualified health plans and association health plans. Uh, we expect about 8,000 of our QHP members to migrate to AHPs, so, I'm sorry, association health plans in 2019. Um, we did make, we basically said those people will come from all across the small group spectrum with one exception. We did take note that there are a number of small groups that offer only platinum coverage to their employees. Um, this is similar to prior to 2014. There were some associations out there that offered very rich coverage. Typically, that's also uh, augmented by HRAs or HSAs. Um, we believe that these small groups who only offer this very rich coverage will not be interested in association health plans that are expected to have much leaner plan designs than the platinum plan. For that reason, we think these platinum groups, as we're terming them, will remain on the exchange. But uh, these four, these, I'm sorry, these 8,000 members will come from across all the other benefits, including uh, individuals who are in platinum plans but weren't in a group that offered only platinum plans. We assumed all these folks would migrate uh, to AHPs. Um, did you uh, in any way address the repeal of the individual mandate? Yes, thank you. We, um, we did also do that as part of the, the changes due to federal regulation. Um, the penalty associated with the individual mandate was repealed at the federal level. I'm sorry, it was made zero at the federal level. The individual mandate still exists at the federal level. The penalty associated with it is now zero. Um, so as a result of that, we expect there to be a number of healthy individuals who dropped their coverage in 2019. Uh, to come up with these assumptions, we looked at uh, historical experience for members who had no or very low claim costs, and we assumed that these members would, would make a decision to drop coverage, or many of these members would make a decision to drop coverage in 2019. Um, Vermont has recently passed a law in with an individual mandate specific to Vermont that starts in 2020. It will have a yet to be defined penalty associated with it. Um, we do not believe that, uh, that this will impact any, anyone's decision in 2019 because of guarantee issue. Members can drop their coverage in 2019 and then re-enroll in 2020 with no penalty. Um, I also want to point out that the, the assumptions that we made are in line with best estimate assumptions. Um, uh, that were developed by an, an actuarial study that was published by the board and by DFR. And do we know more about the risk transfer program after the filing was made? We do. So there, there were a few other assumptions that went into the filing. Uh, risk transfers are one of them. At the time of filing, we had an assumption based on the information we had available at the time. Uh, after the filing, we knew more about the 2017 risk adjustment. This was part of our amendment and part of the LNE recommendations, um, so it was included in the amendment. Um, we also had to make some assumptions as to uh, administrative costs. How are those going to trend forward over time? We included a 3% assumption for wage increases and a 0% assumption for all other items. And did you consider pay to allow factors for the plans? We did. That's a, that's a, another set of assumptions. So I, I mentioned we started with we start with allowed claim costs, paid to allowed adjustments take us from allowed paid costs to paid costs. So paid claims are the, are the portion paid by the benefits that we offer, as opposed to member cost sharing. So there is a pricing actuarial value. I want to make sure we distinguish that from the metal level actuarial value. The metal level value is based on a federal calculator with a nationwide set of experience data within it. Um, and that defines whether a plan is bronze or silver or gold or platinum. The pricing actuarial value is developed specifically based upon Vermont utilization within QHPs. And that calculates how much of a given plan design will be paid by the Blue Cross benefit as opposed to member cost sharing. Um, also, as part of that, there's a benefit richness adjustment. Uh, and that basically reflects that members in richer plans tend to use their benefit more frequently. That particular assumption is based upon uh, federal factors. So that was the non-trend assumptions. Can you describe your trend assumptions uh, for the board? 
Sure, so trend is uh, probably the most meaningful assumption that we make, uh, and I'll discuss medical and then pharmacy trend. Medical trend, we split into two pieces. We have utilization trend and unit cost trend. Uh, as part of utilization trend, that not only includes the number of services, it also includes the mix or intensity of those services. So to develop a utilization trend, we look at past and emerging patterns of care. And in doing that, we developed a, a utilization trend assumption of 2%. Um, that 2% has been corroborated by Dr. Plavin, our chief medical officer, uh, in terms of the drivers of that 2% trend. Uh, and those include a, a few main ones that I, I want to go through. So uh, pharmaceuticals dispensed in a medical setting have increased by about 15% from 2016 to 2017. So it's a pretty huge jump. Uh, these are similar to specialty drugs on the retail pharmacy side that we know are also increasing at a very fast, fast pace. Many of these are life-saving medications, but they are very expensive. Um, so these include things like cancer drugs, uh, rheumatoid arthritis drugs, immunodeficiency drugs. Um, all these, again, these are wonderful things for our members. They, in some cases, cure diseases or increase quality of life, but they are very expensive and they're driving up utilization trend. The second thing that we noticed was an increase in office visits and preventive care. Those went up 4 and 7% respectively from a utilization perspective. Um, this was primarily driven by an increase in mental health professional services, uh, which we see as driving care to the correct setting and getting people the care they need, and that will prevent higher claim costs in the long run. We also saw a pretty significant uptick in colonoscopies, uh, which also is a good thing. Uh, the, the evidence it actually does not indicate that this will reduce costs in the long run, but it will identify cancers earlier and it will save lives. Um, so for that reason, it's, it's important that folks get their colonoscopy screenings. So we see that, again, as a positive development, even though it is driving utilization upward. Uh, finally, we saw an increase in diagnostic services, uh, x-rays, labs, high dollar imaging. We think that's associated with the increase in, in primary care and office visits that we saw. So that's utilization trend. Unit cost trend consists of a few pieces as well. Uh, a portion of that, about a little over 50% of medical costs are for facilities that fall under the jurisdiction of the Green Mountain Care Board uh, in their hospital budget review process. So for those facilities, we made the assumption that increases would match those from last year, except unless a facility had made a public commitment to a commercial rate increase that was lower than what they had last year. In that case, we worked it into our projection. Uh, we also have other providers with whom Blue Cross directly contracts, and we have out-of-area providers that are accessed through our Blue Card system. Uh, we don't directly contract with those out-of-area providers. So where we contract, we, in, we included anything we know about ongoing contract negotiations in our unit cost trends. And for everything else, we provided, um, I'm sorry, we relied upon uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield Association trend survey that demonstrated how costs are increasing elsewhere in the country. How about uh, pharmacy trends? Is that one of the trends that you were? Um, it is. Included? In yes. Um, so pharmacy trend, we used a similar approach to what we did for medical utilization trend, looking at paths and emerging patterns of care. Uh, but we tempered that in a few ways. One thing we did was to look specifically at drugs that are losing their patent protection and moving from brands to much less expensive generic utilization. So that became part of our trip. Hmm, excuse me. Uh, we also took a look at specialty medications. These are similar to the, uh, the medications that are dispensed in facilities and that they're very high cost, but often life-saving drugs. Um, they make up almost the entirety of the drug pipeline. Almost every drug that you will see come out over the next few years will be a very high cost specialty medication. Um, these are curing previously incurable diseases in some cases, and in all cases, they're greatly improving quality of life. We cover those for our members. That has a pretty profound impact, however, on the pharmacy trend. So with all those considerations, pharmacy trend in total is 13.3%. Um, we did separately consider 
our negotiations with our pharmacy benefit manager in terms of pricing. So 13.3% is without those pricing considerations. When we add in those, that pricing, it has the impact of reducing the 13.3% trend down to about 9.9%. And did you make any subsequent amendments to the trend to reflect Blue Cross initiatives? Um, we, we did have another change that impacts trend. I, I want to avoid, I think, the use of the word amendment. This was not part of our amendment. But in our original filing, uh, we included the impact of a cost containment effort that we're uh, implementing in conjunction with our providers and in conjunction with One Care Vermont. And this effort has two primary goals. One is to reduce hospital admissions by 4% by reducing readmissions. Two is to reduce emergency room visits by 5%. And we're going to achieve those things uh, through, a coordinated, through a collaborative care coordination process that in some cases directs care more appropriately to primary care providers. Um, this initiative is expected to have an impact on trend, if you, if you include it within trend, of about 1.1%. So it will reduce our trend from 2% utilization trend for 2018 to 0.9% utilization trend for 2019. Um, that in turn has an, imp excuse me, has an impact of about 0.8% on premiums. Did L and E offer any opinion on your trend assumptions? They did. Um, they opined that our both our medical and our pharmacy trend assumptions ma matched their best estimates. They were in the midpoint of their expected ranges. And do you agree with that portion of their opinion? I, I don't. I think it's misleading for L and E to have included our cost containment strategy as part of trend. That's a separate initiative. Trend is a look at how costs have been changing in the past and are expected to continue to change in the future in the absence of some sort of external event that acts upon them. So when they looked at utilization trend, they agreed that 2% was the best estimate and they provided a range of 1.6% to 2.4%. They similarly agreed that 2.7% was our best estimate for cost trend. When you put those things together, you get a range of 4.2% to 5.2%. That's different from the range they published in their report, because in their report, they threw the cost containment into there. So the distinction I want to draw is that Blue Cross is moving trend from an expected range of 4.2% to 5.2%. In 2018, we are in the midpoint of that at 4.7%. In 2019, we are moving that down by the 1.1% I mentioned for the cost containment efforts. So our 2019 trend is 3.6%. That's well below the 4.2% to 5.2% range. In fact, it's even below the range that, that LME published in their report that I think is misleading because it did incorporate those efforts already. So we are making efforts to reduce trend below the bottom point of the range. In the past, the board has made adjustments to trend to move it to the low point of the range. That would be clear error this year because Blue Cross is already taking the initiative to implement programs that will move that trend line below the low point of LME's range. Similarly, on pharmacy trend, um, I noted that the 13.3% trend, which LME agrees is best estimate, is before Blue Cross Blue Shield contracting efforts. Those contracting efforts will have the impact of moving that trend down to 9.9%, which is far below LNE's best estimate. Uh, what contribution to members' reserve was requested? Uh, we filed a 1.5% contribution to member reserves. That is a long-term assumption. That is, that's the minimum long-term assumption necessary for us to keep pace with uh, the increase in medical claims as well as unforeseen adverse events. And can you give us examples of unforeseen events that have actually occurred? Uh, yes, we actually answered that question as part of the Q&A. That's, uh, that's in section nine of the binder, uh, starting on page 258. We provided um, quite an enumeration of a, of a number of unforeseen adverse events that have actually happened to us over the past five years. It's a long list. I don't want to read the whole thing for you. 
Um, but I do want to highlight a few of these just to show kind of the variety of unforeseen events that can occur. Uh, so I kind of just pick one from each year. So federal regulation has been uh, fairly dynamic, shall we say, under the Trump administration. We kind of never know what we're going to get. In some cases, we're able to react to that and build it into rates. In other cases, we are not. CSR defunding occurred in late 2017. Uh, we were not able to build that into rates. As a result, we expect about a $7 million hit to surplus for, for us living up to the promises we made to members and covering them for those cost share reduction plans. Those monies won't be refunded by, by the federal government. They will instead come out of surplus. It's about $7 million. Um, if we look at 2017, the Green Mountain Care Board made explicit cuts to utilization trend that were below the recommendation of their actuaries. Uh, that lower utilization trend did not materialize, um, and we will have to use about $4 million of reserves, or we did in fact use about $4 million of reserves to cover those additional claims beyond what we were able to put into rates. Um, in 2016, uh, within the large group line of business, uh, we covered premature twins who were born um, in late 2016 and required several months of intensive care. They were eventually discharged, um, and we paid a medical bill of about a million dollars for those twins. Obviously, we can't include that sort of thing into rates, so that million dollars essentially comes out of surplus. If we go back to 2015, actuarial projections can be challenging in a time of significant change or uncertainty. Uh, in other words, we're not always right. So when the ACA was first implemented, uh, once we were able to look at experience, we noticed that individuals were making plan selections that were right for them financially, but our rates did not include that uh, within premiums. We therefore needed to make an adjustment moving forward. We started making that adjustment with our 2016 uh, rate filing. That's the selection adjustment I mentioned earlier. It's still in our filing today. Um, but because we didn't recognize that that adjustment needed to be made for 2015, that cost us about $7 million. So again, that money comes out of reserves. Um, the final one I want to point out, if we go to 2014, because of issues with the rule out of Vermont Health Connect in early 2014, we had a number of members who did not yet have their ID cards. Um, so what Blue Cross did is if members showed up at the pharmacy, they didn't have an ID card, but they said that they had tried to enroll through Vermont Health Connect and into a Blue Cross plan. We covered their medications free of charge. So that program was about $200,000, which is not the largest number that I mentioned, but we can only implement those sorts of programs to help see Vermonters through difficult changes in their health care if we have an adequate level of reserves. So what is Blue Cross's average requested rate increase? Um, our average requested rate increase is 6.7%? I'm blanking, 6.9%. Thank you. Um, and that, that is the amount that Vermonters will actually feel. Okay, so when you think about silver loaded plans, those rates are going to be going up by 20% very nearly on average. But because federal premium subsidies will go up uh, at the same amount, at the same pace, or in our case, probably even at a faster pace than that, Vermonters won't feel that change. So concentrating only on what individuals and small businesses will feel, we're at 6.9%. That's after the amendment that we filed. Uh, and since 2014, what is Blue Cross's actual realized contribution reserves for this business? Uh, for this line of business, it's negative 1.2%. And what did Blue Cross expect after regulatory action uh, for the same time horizon? We expected positive 0.7%. And what was the Green Mountain Care Board's approved CTR for this period? Uh, an average of about 1.2%. So why doesn't the approved CTR match the expected CTR? Um, the Green Mountain Care Board sometimes orders uh, reductions to assumptions below those that were recommended by their actuaries. In those cases, we absolutely implement them into rates, but we don't build them into our forecast of expected results. 
And are those the CTR, or are you talking about other assumptions? I'm talking about other assumptions, so trends and assumptions other than that. And what do you conclude about those results? Well, I, I think it's clear that our rates have been inadequate over the past four years. Um, I, I'd also say that it's very clear that since actual results have been an average of 2% lower than expected results, that our assumptions have not been at the high end of the range. In fact, if anything, they've been too low. And can you walk us through the numerical components of the 6.9%? Yes. So uh, as with <laughs> any projection or any, any uh, assessment of how rates change from year to year, we need to start with actual experience. So if we look at 2017 experience and compare it to the 2017 experience implicit in last year's rate filing, uh, we find that they're almost exactly equivalent, which is good news. Um, we also find that risk adjustment was significantly higher in terms of a receivable to us than what we expected. So in combination, those things drive a reduction of rates of about 1.3%. <coughs> uh, far and away, the biggest driver of the increase in rates is trend. Um, trend increases rates from 18 to 19 by about 7.3%. That consists of all the different components I talked about earlier. So for utilization trend, uh, as you recall, the board last year reduced utilization trend from 2% to 1%. We re-examined that this year. Uh, we continue to see evidence of a 2% utilization trend. So in restoring that to a 2% level and projecting it forward another year, that impacts premiums by about 2.3% for utilization trend. For unit cost trend, uh, those increases drive premiums up by about 2%. Pharmacy trend, which I indicated was 13.3% was before our uh, contracting efforts, drive an increase of about 3% of premiums. So those three things together were about 7.3%. Um, we had a number of other factors. I talked about the uh, population adjustments that we made. There were also some benefit tweaks that were made um, to the plans, including the recent, recently enacted statutes. All those things combined increased rates by about a half a percent. Um, looking at CTR, restoring CTR to an adequate level increased rates from 2018 to 2019 by one and a half percent. Administrative expenses and other fees increased rates by about 1%. That includes 0.6% in terms of an increase for Blue Cross Blue Shield administrative costs. So to kind of frame that in a somewhat different way, if we were not projecting any increases in claims and we did not have to restore CD CTR to its adequate level, we would be looking at a 0.6% rate increase as part of this filing. Uh, Finally, there, we talked about the number of federal changes that we had to take into account. Uh, one was good for premiums. The federal insurer fee was suspended for a year. That lowers premiums by 2%. Uh, the other two, unfortunately, were not helpful to qualified health plan premiums. The individual mandate had the impact of increasing costs by about 2.2%, um, increasing premiums, I should say, by 2.2% and association health plans coming on the market and giving small groups an alternative to QHPs is expected to increase the cost, the premiums for QHPs by an additional 2.1%. So it's a lot of numbers. If anyone was keeping a running tab, what you get is an 11.6% rate increase. I testified that our actual file rate increase is 6.9%. The difference between those two are rate mitigation actions that were taken by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. Uh, there are a number of these. First, we made good on our promise to Vermonters that all realized uh, benefits of tax reform would be passed along to them. Uh, so we lowered premiums by 1.1% in recognition of uh, tax reform. Secondly, in terms of pharmacy contracting, we work very closely with our pharmacy benefit manager to do two things. One is to significantly improve our discounts at retail pharmacies and mail order pharmacies. Um, also our discounts on specialty drugs. Additionally, we worked with them to maximize the rebates that we received from drug manufacturers. All those things together um, benefited rates by about 2.3%. And finally, I discussed earlier the cost containment efforts that we're undertaking in conjunction with providers and with OneCare Vermont on the medical side. 
those items decrease rates by another 0.8% in total. That's 4.2% um, of rate mitigation that Blue Cross has, has uh, worked hard to achieve over the past year, which is about $16 million in rate reductions. This is a graph showing the components of average filed Blue Cross premiums over the past three years. This, is, this was prepared um, under my direction from information that's readily available in each of the last, in this and the previous two rate filings before the, before the board. And is it a summary? Yes. Okay. And what is it a summary of? It is a summary of? So this is a summary of the various components of average filed premium. And I can describe those. So we have, and does everyone have this? I can't do that yet. Um, so I would ask that uh, Exhibit 18 uh, be admitted into the record. And could you have those? We, we have not seen the record yet. And we have not heard from Mr. Ankoff. Yes, yeah, so the vertical axis is average premium in dollars per member per month. The horizontal axis, axis is time, so just each of our three years that we observe. The various uh, areas within the graph, at the bottom, the blue area represents administrative expense and contribution to member reserves that we filed in each of these three years. The green area above that uh, is representative of claim costs for each of the three years. At the very top, we have a red area that shows the taxes and fees that were inherent in each filing. You'll notice that kind of varies from year to year. The big difference being the federal insurer fee was in place in 2018 and was not in place in 17 or 19. Uh, and finally, there's this, this yellow triangle at the top this shows the impact on 2019 rates of various federal, re federal regulation that has come out over the past year. Um, so that's not, that's association health plans. Uh, that's also the removal of the penalty for the individual mandate. Um, that also shows CSR defunding. This, this is prepared while I talked about the impact felt by Vermonters in my previous testimony. This is the overall average increase, so it does include, that's the silver load. So that's, what, that's what's in the yellow triangle. So what does this graph show in terms of average filed uh, premium increases? So I, what it shows is that the vast majority of average filed premium increases, 90%, as I testified earlier, is due to the act, is because of act payments made to providers for care that they've provided to Vermonters in these plans. And you're familiar with the recommendations prepared by the board's actuary? Yes, I am. And is that exhibit 13 of the binder? That is exhibit 13 of the binder. And how many recommendations has Lewis Nellis made? There are five recommendations. 
And can you describe the nature of the first four recommendations? Uh, the first four were recommendations uh, for changes to actuarial assumptions having to do with population changes. And do you oppose any of those recommendations? Uh, we don't oppose any of them. In fact, we incorporated all four of them into our amended filing. And what about the fifth recommendation? Uh, the fifth recommendation is that the Green Mountain Care Board should consider hospital budget submissions as part of their decision as well. And are you familiar with the hospital budget submissions that were recently filed with the Green Mountain Care Board? Yes, I've reviewed a summary of the commercial rate increases uh, included in those submissions um, that was prepared based on information publicly available on the Green Mountain Care Board website. And what impact would those hospital budget submissions along with any other known contracting changes have on your unit cost trend assumptions? Um, we would need to increase our unit cost trend from 2.66% to 2.99%. Um, I can split that out a little bit. We would need to increase our unit cost trend for, uh, for providers under the purview of the Green Mountain Care Board Hospital Budget Review to 3.2% and we would decrease the unit cost trend for other providers to 2.8%. And what about UVMMC? Right, so the, the largest driver of that is UVMMC. They publicly committed to a 0% commercial rate increase, and that's what you'll find in our filing. Their hospital budget submission includes a 4% commercial rate increase. And was that commitment made to the board in February? It was, yes. Do you intend to resubmit the filing to reflect the increase in the unit cost trend represented by these changes? Uh, no, we don't intend to, and they were not included as part of our amendment either. Uh, we believe that the board will be able to manage the unit, the commercial rate increases uh, for these hospitals down to the level that was included within our filing. And are there any areas of disagreement between you and the board's actuary with respect to their explicit re recommendations? There are none with respect to their recommendations. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we, we do have a disagreement with them in terms of how they presented their range for, uh, for trend. So turning again to the binder that has been provided to the board, and contains the exhibits that have been admitted into evidence. Are you familiar with exhibits two through 12? Uh, yes, these are all responses we provided as part of the, the Q&A process. Uh, questions submitted by either uh, Lewis and Ellis, the board's actuary, by the board themselves, or by the healthcare advocate. And were you involved in drafting the responses to those questions? I was. I, I actually I signed the responses um, to 2 through 8 and to 11 and 12, and I was involved with the responses uh, included in the binder as 9 and 10, and I'm familiar with their contents. So exhibits 1 through 12 and 17, all of which are now in evidence, uh, does that comprise the complete filing uh, that the board has under consideration? Yes, that's correct. Are you familiar with Vermont's standards for rate approval? Yes, I am. And in your professional opinion, are the rates as filed, including the amendment, adequate? Um, actuarial standard of practice number eight provides guidance to healthcare actuaries who are uh, submitting rates as part of a, a filing and review process. Within that standard of practice, they define rates as adequate if they provide for payment of claims, administrative costs, taxes, regulatory fees, and a reasonable contingency or profit margin. So these rates are not inadequate. And are they excessive? Neither are they excessive. Uh, the same standard of practice defines excessive rates as those that exceed what's required to pay for the things I just mentioned, claims, administrative expenses, taxes, fees, and a reasonable profit or contingency margin. Are they unfairly discriminatory? Uh, they are not. And are they reasonable in relation to the benefits that will be provided in the 2019 plans? Yes, they are reasonable. 
And are you familiar with the other statutory standards that apply to this plan? I am. They include affordability uh, they, and promoting access to care and promoting quality care. And do the rates as filed meet the standards of promoting access to care and promoting quality care? They do meet those standards. Um, we, we did provide uh, some of those responses within the Q&A that has been admitted into evidence, and my colleagues will expand upon those standards in their testimony. And are the rates affordable? It's an interesting question. So to address that, I'd like to first turn to Exhibit 18 again. Um, I want to address some lines on this exhibit that I did not address earlier. Uh, there are three dotted lines on the page. I'm going to start from the bottom and work my way up. The bottom dotted line is the blue line above the blue area of the graph. This shows the maximum administrative expense in CTR, a combination of those two things, that carriers are allowed under federal and Vermont laws. Um, What's notable here is that our actual admin and CTR is about 60% lower than that maximum. If you go to other jurisdictions, you will find for-profit carriers in those jurisdictions filing rates that are much closer to that maximum dotted line. Similarly, if we move up to the gray dotted line that's above the, the red area, that shows what premiums would have been had we filed at the maximum allowable sum of admin and contribution to reserve. The rates are about, that we did file are about 10% lower than that gray dotted line. Finally, there's a purple dotted line at the very top of the graph. The difference between the gray and the purple lines are Blue Cross Blue Shield care management and fraud, waste, and abuse efforts. Um, notably, these efforts in 2019 reduced premiums by about 8%. They would be about 8% higher if we didn't have those programs and they weren't part of, of what we do. Notably, that 8% is very close. In fact, it's within a dollar of the administrative costs and contribution to reserve that we include in the filing. So in other words, we essentially pay for ourselves through our care management and fraud, waste, and abuse efforts. Um, I also want to consider as part of this graph, again, I want to return to the green, which represent, along with the yellow, the green plus the yellow represents payments to providers for care they provide to Vermonters. Um, again, this is 90% of the total premium. Since these rates are not excessive, they can only be unaffordable if the underlying cost of care represented by this green area is unaffordable. Now, when the Green Mountain Care Board makes cuts to rates that are below the recommendation of their actuaries, they're effectively requiring the Blue Cross fund the difference out of surplus, and in doing so are creating a conflict between affordability and solvency. In the absence of such rate cuts, that conflict does not exist. Uh, the Department of Financial Regulation has opined that solvency is the most basic aspect of consumer protection. Um, in fact, I would say that solvency is the most basic tenet of affordability. And can you... Um explain some of the policy choices that have been made that affect uh, affordability or the cost of the benefits and the payments that are being made to providers? Absolutely. So affordability really can't be assessed in the absence of looking at policy. Uh, and Vermont has made a number of policy decisions over, over this last several years that do impact affordability. Um, notably, uh, Vermont decided that at the onset of the program that members making less than 300% of federal poverty level, uh, the premiums would not be affordable for these members. Therefore, they implemented the Vermont premium assistance and additional cost share reductions for members below 300% of FPL. Notably, they did not implement similar programs for members making more than 300% of FPL. Uh, as the board is aware, the state has convened a working group that has been looking at a 1332 waiver that would leverage federal dollars uh, as well as state funding to make premiums more affordable for everyone. 
Blue Cross has been a very active participant of that work group. Um, I want to address age rating. Uh, Vermont does not allow age rating. There's only one other state that does not allow age rating. Uh, we're all familiar with those depressing studies that come out every year from the Kaiser Family Foundation that show, generally speaking, Vermont has the second highest rates for a 40-year-old non-smoker. Uh, those come out every year. If Vermont allowed age rating, as almost every other state does, rates for a 40-year-old would be more than $200 lower than they are today. That would completely change the dynamic. In those studies, Vermont would show not at the top of the premium list, but in the bottom quintile of states for affordability for a 40-year-old. So let me explain that a little bit differently. Vermont's decision in policy was to make this one of the very best states to purchase insurance if you're older than 55 or so, because younger members are required to subsidize the costs of older members. Of course, the flip side of that policy decision is to make this among the very most expensive states in the union to get insurance if you're younger than age 45 or so. The break even is about age 52. So circling back a little bit, if, we look, if those studies looked at the average 52-year-old instead of the average 40-year-old, Vermont would be in the, in the 10 most affordable states to purchase health insurance for an individual. Um, so Vermont could very easily make this coverage more affordable for young families if they decided to allow age rating. The policy decision, on the other hand, was to make this make these rates as very, very affordable for individuals who are nearing retirement. Um, so, so those things that you just described, can you relate them to the green um, area on Exhibit 18? Yeah, for, for each of those three, they don't really change the size of the green area, but they do change who pays the premium for that, and it makes it more affordable or less affordable for a segment of the population or for the whole population. There is one other policy consideration I want to address, and that's the cost shift. Um, because Medicare and Medicaid do not fully fund what they pay providers, in other words, providers' costs are not fully funded by what Medicare and Medicaid pays them, those costs need to be shifted to private commercial payers. That includes individuals, small businesses, and large groups. Um, it's arguable that large employers have the deep pockets that are necessary to bear the burden of the cost shift and continue to pay a substantial portion of the premium on behalf of their employees. It is arguable as to whether individuals and small groups who are paying these costs out of, the, out of their pockets can or should also bear the burden of the cost shift. <coughs> So can the Green Mountain Care Board influence the green in the hospital budget process? Yes, yeah, so policy isn't the only way to make this more affordable. We can also take action to actively reduce the size of this green area. Uh, the Green Mountain Care Board is a key and valuable player in that, both through your hospital budget review process, through your oversight of payment reform, uh, and many other initiatives. Blue Cross is also a key player in this through our own cost containment efforts, through our own payment reform initiatives. Um, and in fact, it is all we do, well, every day, is work hard at reducing the green and the blue bars. We have every motivation to do so. Um, it, it's part of our mission to do so. So we do everything we can to reduce that while still maintaining access to care. Uh, so I think there are two ways that we could make this more affordable. One is by prioritizing affordability over access to care, and my colleagues will describe that in a little bit more detail. The other way is to create policy change and change that regulatory and statutory environment. Blue Cross is ready to, and willing to lead with the Green Mountain Care Board in making those changes happen. Uh, just as we have worked hard over the past year to include $16 million of rate mitigation in this year's rates. 
Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Um, I would like to reserve uh, calling Mr. Schultz in rebuttal if necessary. Probably won't be necessary, but I just wanted to uh, reserve that right to see how our time is going, and we should have time to do that. Thank you. Um, so, Ms. Green, could you identify your position at Blue Cross? Yes, uh, I'm Ruth Green. I'm the treasurer and CFO at Blue Cross and Shoe Vermont. I've been there uh, about five and a half years, and I'm responsible for all the financial management functions of the company, um, including treasury function, financial reporting and control, as well as the actuarial and uh, pricing function. Ms. Green, can you speak up a little? Well, maybe we can turn this mic around a little bit. Thank you, Kevin. And we'll take you a little bit better. Thank you. Thank you. Long voice. Uh, and is your CV uh, attached uh, as part of Exhibit 15, pages 320 through 322? Yes, it is. So as C, um, I'm sorry. Um, have you read the solvency opinion that has been submitted by the Department of Financial Regulation? Yes, I have. And is that tab 14 of the binder? Yes, it is tab 14. And as CFO and Treasurer of Blue Cross, what are the key points that you take from that opinion? This year, as I read the DFR solvency opinion, it's clear to me that the commissioner has escalated his message and concern. Um, three key elements in particular stuck out to me. Um, first, the commissioner makes clear that the primary tool or uh, fundamental element of maintaining and ensures solvency is to uh, consistently charge adequate premium rates. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont knows this. Each and every year we've submitted uh, proposed rates that are designed to be adequate. Each year the, the decision of the board has reduced those rates, making it them inadequate. Um, this is not sustainable, clearly. The second point that uh, came from the opinion in my view this year very clearly is that the Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont RBC ratio is uh, trending down, downward. This is true. Um, each and every year when Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont submits rate proposals, again, they're designed to be adequate and include a CTR that's intended to maintain our reserve level. Each and every year, the Green Mountain Care Board uh, reduces that rate, making it in, uh, inadequate and thereby putting pressure on our RBC ratio. This is also not sustainable. The third point that I'll draw out is um, the commissioner uh, outlined in some detail uh, the unprecedented uncertainty, uncertainty in the federal health reform environment. This creates uh, increasing financial risk to us as an organization. And uh, clearly, um, the solvency opinion this year um, was a, a comprehensive walkthrough of uh, how uh, this trend is continuing. So each and every year, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont has done its level best to navigate these changes, the federal Changes happen um, on short notice and in ways that uh, have not been foreseen. And um, we do our level best to navigate these choppy waters. Uh, each and every year, um, the board, when they cut their rate, cut our proposed rate, it um, weakens our reserves and our ability to sustain those uh, hits, if you will. And so uh, I would like to vote um, draw attention to um, the overall message that I took from the solvency opinion was that something has to change. So what is the recent history of rate adequacy for Blue Cross Blue filings under the board's jurisdiction? In its recent decisions, the board, for example, in last year's qualified health plan rate filing, um, 
they've pointed out that their, their task is to strike a balance between the leanest possible rates and protecting the insurer's solvency or financial health. Um, I don't believe that there's a, 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 it's a misnomer that a balance can be had there. They add the fundamental tenet of adequate, um, or fundamental tenet of solvency is that we're consistently charging adequate rates. So um, it really is inconsistent to think that you can chip away at the rate and maintain financial health. That it can't, you can't do both. Um, further, the board has consistently cut our rates, believing that they're incentivizing us to be more efficient and to negotiate um, better rates with our providers. Um, the truth is that we do every day focus on efficiency and every day negotiate and bring our market share to bear on our provider negotiations. However, it is clear that our rates have been inadequate over um, the last several years. From the period 2014 to 2017, we have lost $16 million in this market segment. Second, um, it was uh, part of the pre-hearing Q&A um, on tab 12, um, page 282. And one of the questions that was asked of us was to provide a calculation of what the RBC would be for the QHP business only. The uh, illustration that we provided is just that. It's an illustration because RBC is not uh, a, a tool that's used for a particular standalone line of business. It's used for the whole company. However, it was instructive in that illustration that the approximate RBC for the QH business only um, decreases from 2014, 2013, sorry, to 2017, the QHP business RBC would have declined 239 percentage points. So clearly the rates have not been adequate to sustain the reserves that are needed to navigate the choppy waters both today and into the future. So just with QHP business alone, um, if, if that were our only business, would the level of surplus uh, be within the commissioner's range for surplus that he's determined to be reasonable? It would not. It would have fallen below the target range. And how do you know that Blue Cross is operating efficiently? Blue Cross has uh, demonstrated to the board um, for, through many information uh, sessions that we work every day to continuously improve our operating efficiency. Um, a couple of data points I'll draw your attention to in this rate filing is um, that we've LME included in their report in section 13 of the binder, um, a reference on page 303 that uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's administrative costs are lower than 95% of the other Blue Cross Blue Shield plans nationwide. And this is notable in the sense that we are much smaller than many of those plans and um, much economic theory holds that we would lack scale, but we have worked very hard on making our administrative cost ratio um, one of the best uh, we also um, have answered in some of the pre-hearing Q&A questions relating to the um, operating efficiency, and again, that's on in tab 12, and this one is on um, page 276. Uh, I won't go through it in all the detail that is in the response that's there for you to read, but clearly, on the bottom of page 276, we've shown that our operating expenses per member per month um, are well below uh, the latest available benchmark um, median. Uh, in particular, the small group and individual insured book of business is 35.50 cents um, per member per month, 
and the benchmark median is $41 per metric ton, $41.02 on that exhibit. So we know we're efficient. We work really hard at it. It's part of everything we do, and uh, having the board feel the need to cut a rate below the level that it's adequate to incentivize us is really, we have no need to be further incentivized. Our customer, we have to compete for our customers, and they expect us to um, spend as little as possible on our operating expenses. And does Blue Cross um, serve all of its markets in the same way? Yes, uh, we compete in uh, several Vermont markets. We're one of the uh, only carriers who uh, competes across both the small group and individual market, the large group insured and self-funded market. We also offer Medicare supplement products, and we also have a Medicare Part D product. All of our um, offerings, um, we compete for the business that we have, and uh, we are motivated to make sure that each of our segments are operating as efficiently as possible. So are the rates that Blue Cross is proposing affordable, provide quality care, and promote access to health care? Yes, they are. I um, wanted to draw attention, as Paul mentioned, to the um, answer to the pre-hearing questions in tab 9. So if you could turn to page 235, page 9. We were asked to provide support for the extent, to the extent that it exists, that Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont is proposing rates that support affordable rates, promote quality of care, and promote access to health care. I'm not going to go through the answers uh, in detail here. We had um, a lot of really good examples that we went to some length to make sure that the board understood and, and could you know, see how the connection was made specifically. Um, but I would like to just uh, draw attention to our introduction on page 236 of that answer. Um, the, the three interrelated standards of affordability, quality, and access to care are intended to work together, there's a tension between those three things. And the goal for Vermont and Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont is to find a balance between those three competing goals. And often, if you um, achieve more results on one of the goals, oftentimes one of the other goals will suffer. Um, so. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, in this answer here, um, we were focused on these objectives, and our goal was, is a transformed healthcare system in which every Vermonter has healthcare coverage and receives timely, effective, affordable care. That's in our vision. It was in our vision long before the uh, Green Mountain Care Board was created, and we continue to pursue those objectives, working with the stakeholders in the healthcare system in Vermont. The challenge is when you pursue one of those objectives to the detriment of one of the other um, of the so-called triple aim, sometimes uh, you um, have a less than optimal situation on the one that's um, um, being um, out of balance. So Vermont has frequently pursued um, access and high quality care. We get very high marks for the quality of health care available in Vermont, and um, oftentimes that will come at a higher cost for health plans. And has the board ever expressed um, its opinion on the triple aim? Yeah, but I believe, and it's uh, in the decisions that we've had over the years that the board shares that goal of working to um, find that optimum uh, place where the tension between those three, three things um, can be brought to bear in the Vermont market. So what is Blue Cross's um, contribution to reserve philosophy? Blue 
difference with Sheila Vermont's uh, contribution to reserve philosophy is um, one that we like to set a long-term objective and stick with it so that we uh, avoid any uh, fluctuations that are unnecessary in, in our rates and, and delivering uh, premium rates to our customers. We did outline that philosophy in some detail this year. It's somewhat new. It was right as part of the um, rate filing itself in tab one. Um, we outlined on pages 180 through 181 um, the uh, approach that we use in coming up with a, an appropriate contribution to reserve. And again, in, I won't go through that in detail. It's there. We, we outline on page 180 our, our CTR philosophy, uh, just so that it would be clear for everyone. A couple of points I'd like to draw your attention to is the, um, the long-term assumption had been 2% for many years. And with the uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that came into play at the end of December, we were able to reduce that one point or the two percent CTR long-term assumption to one of 1.5 percent, and that is uh, directly a reflection of passing the um, the fact that Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont no longer pays federal corporate income taxes. We've passed that along in the rate through that CTR assumption. It used to be one two uh, percent; it's now 1.5 percent. And what is Blue Cross's adequate long-term level of RBC, risk-based capital? Um, as in the past, we've mentioned to the board that our, our target RBC range is 500 to 700%, and we believe um, that this range has served us in the past. This range was put into place over 10 years ago, um, very much before the advent of the recent volatility in um, the federal uh, health care reform um, environment. So the, with the recent market volatility and regulatory changes, this is very much um, um, an adequate but clearly not excessive target range. And if Blue Cross were to go through the bottom of the range, what is the upshot of that? So um, clearly, if the, the board continues targeting to the low end of the range, let's say 500% or somewhat above that, it's implicitly um, taking on more risk than um, uh, in today's environment that it might have 10 years ago. Um, if the rates go below the range, our CTR philosophy is such that we have to increase our long-term assumption in a particular rate filing from the 1.5% to something um, higher in order to um, move our surplus back into that range. Clearly, that sets off a possible chain of events where um, we're increasing our rates, we become less competitive, we have to compete for our business, um, we'll lose business potentially, and then that has um, the um, further uh, detriment that we might not be able to serve all the markets in Vermont that we um, are capable and uh, currently believe in serving. I would like to point out too, um, Lewis and Ellis in their report on page, in tab 13 on page um, 304, just to put the Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont's RBC range into context um, on page 304. Ellen, you both um, opined that they felt our long-term assumption of CTR of 1.5% was reasonable. They also reviewed our double of RBC relative to the other blue plans uh, nationwide, and they found that over half of the Blue Cross Blue Shield plans nationwide had actual RBCs higher than the maximum of our range. So our range is clearly not excessive. So we heard a little bit about the alternative minimum tax credit um, in Mr. Angoff's opening. Um, does that credit provide for increased RBC for Blue Cross today? 
It does not provide for increased RBC today. The AMT credit is a function of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. It eliminated the corporate AMT, and the result is that uh, beginning in late 2019 and over five years from that time, Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont will be able to recover our AMT. We did answer a question. We provided um, details about that in our rate filing, and we also answered a question on um, sorry, tab four, um, page 210, where we outlined uh, it's the last page in that tab. We outlined that um, the 16 million will, assuming that um, our results and our tax filing for the 2018 year um, are consistent with the estimates we're making today, we estimate 16 million will be refunded from the IRS in late 2019, and then we'll receive um, 7.9 in 2020. 3.6 million in 21 and another 2.8 in 2022. So this recoverable um, is out on the horizon. It's a great thing. We're happy about it. It's, it's one of the um, federal changes that um, HCA's uh, lawyer has said that you know it was a positive, but it hasn't happened yet. It will happen in late 2019 at the earliest. Um, it is subject to uh, assumptions around what will be sequestered in terms of the IRS payments. And we also uh, recognize that federal payments um, have not necessarily been as reliable as we might think they have been over the last uh, 20 years. We have very current examples of situations where the federal government has withheld payments. The cost share reduction payment was completely halted on October 12th, 2017. Um, overnight, our premiums were underfunded. And uh, we also have the recent uh, notification from CMS that the risk adjustment payments for 2017, which is a program that's a fundamental piece of the ACA, and those payments, which are significant, are um, frozen at the moment. So um, even though the AMT is very much a positive thing, uh, we will um, record it and reflect it in the financials when we receive it. And, and if you do receive it, how will you use it? As we have said in our comments about the impact of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, um, all of the benefit of those uh, changes will be passed on to policyholders and, and members for all of our businesses, not just the, the QHP business. Um, when those tax AMT um, refunds come to us, they will come into surplus, and to the extent that our surplus position is within our target range, it will serve to mitigate um, future increases to, to members. And perhaps backfill some of the exactly. other so changes. If you, just to, be really specific about it, in 20, late 2019, when we received the 2016 payment, um, the way I would be thinking about that, it would first go to cover the 2018 CSR defunding that is sitting as a, as a um, empty coffer in our member surplus. So um, when we get to late 2019, to the extent that our surplus is in good shape, um, we would have the opportunity to mitigate rate increases. So what is Blue Cross's goal with this rate filing, including the amendment? Blue Cross Blue Shield's goal is clearly to have funded premium rates. As I mentioned, in observing the commissioner's solvency opinion, the fundamental tenet of uh, maintaining our solvency is to have consistently funded premium rates. And so we're here today to um, outline that that is, a, for 2019, a rate increase proposal of 6.9%. That's what we need. Um, my next questions will be directed to uh, Andrew Garland. 
Uh, and Mr. Garland's uh, CV is not in the binder, uh, but he was noticed as a fact witness. Um, so I would like to ask him a little bit about his background and experience um, because you don't have it in the writing. Go ahead, please. Thanks. Uh, so, Mr. Garland, where do you currently work? Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont. Okay, and what is your position there? I'm the Vice President of Client Relations and External Affairs. And how long have you held that position? Uh, for a little over three years. And before that position, where were you? I was at MVP Healthcare for three years as the Vice President of Payment Reform and Network Strategy. And before that? Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, uh, back to 2002. And did you start your career in insurance in 2002? No, in 1998 with uh, Kaiser Permanente Healthcare in Oakland, California. So you've heard, um, or I should say you've read, uh, some of the Green Mountain Care Board decisions. And does the Green Mountain Care Board need to provide Blue Cross with incentive to be more efficient and to lower the cost of care by cutting requested rates? No. Um, the marketplace provides that incentive. I, I think it's very important to re-articulate that every market we participate in in Vermont is highly competitive. The individual and small group markets, the large group market, both insured and self-insured, uh, the Medicare su supplement and Part D markets, uh, we have extremely strong and many times aggressive competitors in all of these marketplaces. Uh, as Ruth mentioned, we're a small company. The same infrastructure serves all of those markets. So our efficiency, our effectiveness in the small group market is the same efficiency and effectiveness essentially that we're selling uh, in the large group space or in the Medicare space. And all of the clients we serve demand the lowest possible administrative cost right? and the highest value in return. And everybody wants a, a high value evolving health plan at the lowest possible cost. That, that pressure is what um, drives our business every day. Um, and when you think about I, I, I think it might be worth taking a moment just to think about the value and the services that we're talking about. It's not just paying claims and enrolling people and doing those things quick to, quickly and effectively and accurately. That's a part of it. But it's also providing comprehensive data and analytics across a whole range of services, medical care, Rx, uh, prescription drug care, lab, mental health services, all of those uh, brought together so that our clients can understand what's happening uh, with their benefits spend. Um, it involves things like claims management and thought ways and use that Paul talked a little bit about. When a tremendous amount of money flows through our organization, um, billed to us literally by thousands of, of hospitals and providers of, of many different types. It's extremely important that we understand what's happening with all of those dollars as they move through to make sure that the expenditures are appropriate and accurately represent what care was delivered and what care should be paid for. Um, we are expected to provide tools to help our members get most, the most from their benefits. Uh, Vermonters are not looking for low access, uh, cheap, fly by night healthcare products. They buy benefits for their employees or for themselves because they want the best possible care. And they expect us to provide expertise, services, and tools that help their members access that care. Uh, so that's a part of what we do. Uh, they want and expect a compassionate and caring customer service team. Even with the best tools and the most well-meaning providers, the system is extremely complex. And when Vermonters get in trouble with medical bills in front of them, they call us and they ask us to explain what's happening here, help me solve that problem. And they need smart, knowledgeable, highly trained people that will take the time and put the caring into solving those problems for them. Um, Above all, they want access to great care. I, I can't emphasize this enough. I, it must be so different from other regulatory environments where we're talking to insurers about how to get them to pay for more things. In, in Vermont, um, we don't have that challenge. Every client we serve wants the fullest, most robust care that's possible, and they want the best care managers um, at the plan to help them when they're in trouble, help them navigate. So all of those goods and services are expected to be provided by us at the lowest possible cost by all of our clients. 
And if we fail to do that, we fail to compete in the marketplace. And, and I think it's so important to emphasize our clients have options. In the individual and small group market, MVP is a strong competitor. In the large group market, Cigna and Aetna and United push hard um, to try to take business uh, and move to their books. In the Medicare market, uh, Aetna and MVP, again, work very, very hard to take that business. Our, our members, our clients have options. If we're not efficient and effective in all that we do, we lose business and we fail as an organization. Um, so my, I mean, if we, my short answer to the question is that's what we do. That's what we're about. Our mission, our, our purpose in going to work every day is to be as efficient and effective as we possibly can. Um, that's why we exist. There's no further incentive that the board can provide that the market hasn't already provided for us. So you've mentioned um, a whole basket of activities. What about the management team at Blue Cross? Thank you. Um, this is an, ex an extremely important part of what we provide. Um, the system is complex and problems occur, but our, our members certainly and our clients expect that we have a professional, aggressive management team that's working to stop those problems from happening in the first place. Does Blue Cross use its purchasing power in negotiating leverage to lower the cost of care through unit cost negotiations? We absolutely do. We have direct contracts with 20 or 21 hospitals now with a hospital in Massachusetts recently directly contracting with us. Uh, we negotiate actively with every one of those hospitals. Most of them we negotiate with every year. Um, this is a very mature process. In 2008, I took the position of Director of Provider Contracting for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, so I have been participating in that process uh, directly or very closely for a decade. Um, and I can assure you that uh, it is a well-developed, systematic approach to negotiating with um, all of those providers. We collect cost data and utilization data using all the information that we have about the claims that are being paid. We look at the budgets that are submitted to you, uh, cleaning as much as we can about what's happening with the commercial spend relative to the Medicare spend and Medicaid spend. We sit down with the hospitals. We let them know what we know, what we see how what we pay for services at their facilities compared to the cost of services at the other facilities that we contract with, and we push as hard as we can. I would say, given the constraints of our lack of competitive marketplace in the, on the hospital side and our regulatory um, infrastructure, that's a very successful process. Uh, we produce results uh, through that work. We have a second process that's closely aligned to the negotiating, um, which involves a very similar thing with people, in fact, there's a fair amount of overlap um, that focuses on payment policy. And this is the team that looks at how services are changing and the billing of those services is changing over time, and they enact policies to manage the way we pay claims. Uh, so this work very closely affiliated with fraud, waste, and abuse work is essentially meant to correct for new codes that come into the market that may permit um, reimbursement of things that shouldn't be paid for, um, whether there are technical challenges, uh, billing problems, or liberal billing practices which occasionally occur. Uh, that team, which has also existed for more than a decade, um, is working constantly to make sure that we're managing the dollars through, uh, through the door. We also manage directly fee schedules uh, for those where services aren't negotiated, these are the professional fees I believe we've talked about those before, uh, with both primary care and specialists who don't, or, uh, who don't uh, receive payments from us through a hospital contract. Um, I can assure you that our management of those fee schedules has been very, very thorough uh, and has made us few friends uh, in the provider community. And, and you've heard a number of, of sort of public outcries from the providers who are on those fee schedules, which I think offers some evidence that they have been very, um, very thoroughly managed to make sure that we're not overspending for those services. There is uh, one other lever that we could pull um, that we don't. It's the only one I could think of as I was preparing uh, to speak with you today. Um, I think of this as the nuclear option. Um, this is the option where we allow a provider, a hospital, to go out of network. Uh, because we refuse to come to terms with them on a contract. 
uh, if we were operating in a different marketplace, say suburban Maryland, where we had three, four, or five hospitals competing with each other in any community, I suspect that this would be one of the sharpest tools in our toolbox. Um, that is not the case in Vermont. We don't have significant competition in any service area. Um, but we do have access standards. Uh, we have standards to notify members when the providers go out of network. Um, we have many requirements to pay for care, regardless of whether or not we can put a network in place. So I imagine what it would be like to exercise the nuclear option, and I would encourage you to think about that as well. It starts with a letter to 30, 40, 50,000 people saying, effective X date, your provider is no longer in our network. Let's help you find care somewhere else. Um, to me, that is a scenario that is likely to cause a tremendous amount of damage um, and waste, and whether we look at the amount of money we would spend on public relations and legal fees, uh, the damage we would do to our provider relationships, uh, the number of members that we would confuse, frighten, um, lives that we would possibly endanger, uh, frankly, as a, as a result of that confusion and, and fright. Um, and the amount of money we would spend on, on out-of-network care that we would have to pay for anyway, probably at a significantly higher rate. Um, we don't see it as being a, a value-add process, except in the most extreme sort of circumstance. And even then, um, we may just be underfunding or moving underfunding from our books onto someone else's, um, at least if we start with the, the assumption that by definition, any hospital budget has already been approved by the board, so it's adequately funded. If we were to take it down significantly from funding that you approved, we would be underfunding it. Uh, so that, that's an option that is certainly, I would say, here today has not been taken off the table for us, but it's not one we would rush to. Um, there's very dire consequences for, for things about like that. So Blue Cross is also uh, in a contract with OneCare, Vermont's ACO. Um, would they be included within the remarks that you just made? That's, um, yes, they are. We do have a contract with One, One Care for the small group and individual lives. We also have a contract with them now for a self-insured pilot, and we're working with them to extend um, to extend that contract to include more lives. Um, but that's a good example of the type of activity that we're able to do and that we frankly turn our attention to as an alternative to the nuclear option. And that is to work with um, public and private stakeholders, providers, regulators, policymakers on alternatives that create more value through our network. Um, and this, this is also work that, as you mentioned in your opening remarks, Jackie, goes back a very long time. Uh, before there was a director of payment reform for the Vermont Care Board, um, I, was the, I was the director of provider contracting with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, and I brought to our executive team a proposal that we start working on something, and this is back in 2008, called payment reform. There's this new thing happening in the industry, we need to be a part of that. Um, as the Green Mountain Care Board and others in the state have pushed payment reform and other value-add initiatives, we've participated in every one of them. Every pilot that, that uh, Richard Slusky brought to the table, uh, we came, sat down, and said, how can we make this more valuable? We've worked with the Blueprint, we've worked with the state's immunization billing pilot, we've been a part of dozens of work groups. Um, sponsored by the legislature or others to try to come up with better ways to pay for care, um, to solve problems that were making uh, administrative waste for the provider system um, when other commercial payers have been scarce or frankly most of the time non-existent at those, uh, at those meetings or, or as part of those pilots. Um, we've been there trying to find a way to, to make even more value on our provider <coughs> network. Um, that we can through direct contracting. I think we've been highly successful. Thank you. Um, I'd like to transition to Dr. Clayman, and this is his first uh, time before the board in this capacity uh, in a great year. Um, and his uh, CV is in Exhibit 15, uh, pages 323, uh, 325, no, 327, sorry. Um, and so can you tell us what you 
your position? First, identify yourself and tell us what your position is with Blue Cross. Sure. Uh, I'm Josh Clay, and I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Blue Cross. And essentially, that means I oversee our care coordination programs in relation to this discussion. Okay, and how long have you been doing that? Uh, in that position, just under two years, with Blue Cross for just under four years, uh, position in Vermont for 18 years. And where uh, did you practice medicine before you came to Blue Cross? I was at Gifford Healthcare, which is a critical access hospital, and now I'm at FQHC, one of the efforts into becoming an FQHC. So tell us more about your role at Blue Cross. Uh, so, as I, as I alluded to, I oversee our care coordination programs, primarily all of our clinical programs, and um, at Paul, as Paul had mentioned, uh, uh, our cost containment, clinical cost containment activities. Um, we feel these are vital because they really support evidence-based care uh, and, and certainly utilization monitoring, but most importantly, help people navigate a complex healthcare system. Uh, both here in Vermont, but regionally and nationally. Uh, and so we have those connections. Um, and you know, we're uniquely positioned in Vermont because we, our goal is to ensure that our members receive the best care available um, at the lowest cost from all of our providers. Uh, and we receive information from um, about care provided, um, some information about prices, certainly about outcomes. Um, and, and we work strongly with our uh, provider network. And our care management, care managers are local Vermont care managers who have in-depth knowledge of the best care available on a very personal level. Um, you know, the National Academy of Medicine and Institute of Medicine have uh, published studies where they estimate about tw that about 20% of total health care services are provided that really don't improve people's health. Um, wasted medical resources, needlessly increasing costs. And, and so cost containment certainly is a piece of what we do. That can be achieved through many different ways. Um, while we did mention 9.7 million in savings in the binder, page 278, uh, that was for prior approval alone across uh, our, our different initiatives. With our other initiatives, our estimate, estimate is that for about 1.9 million of investment, uh, we achieved 18.1 18, 18 million in savings for this population, uh, the individual, individual and small group population in 2017. Um, this cost avoidance is reflected in the claims experience that uh, Paul has provided, and therefore made our premiums uh, lower than they would have been without those savings. So that's care management overall. Can you talk in more detail about case management? What does that mean and, and what? Is your role in that? Sure. Uh, again, it's a component of our overall care management. And care man, I'll just comment that care management, case management, the definitions of those are in the eye of the view of the, the individual. Um, so we can argue about semantics. But basically, case management is, is about the individual relationship between a nurse and or a social worker, mental health counselor, uh, pharmacist, uh, and uh, at, at uh, Blue Cross. Uh, and individual members. And we focus on those who have high complex uh, and chronic conditions, as well as rare disease and those with catastrophic events and trauma. Um, so we have a team of doctors and nurses and pharmacists and social workers, and because of our partnership with the Broward Retreat, mental health is integrated fully into our uh, system. And we engage our with our members on a very personal level. Um, our engagement rates, in fact, are over 50% whereas the industry benchmark is 27%. Uh, percent, and our member satisfaction exceeds 96%. So once people are engaged and need our help, they really get the help that they need. Um, and, and member feedback is overwhelmingly positive for those whose lives we touch. So I just wanted to kind of give you a case example. Um, and, and this is really care management in general, but certainly this is one that comes from our folks as it were. Um, so we were working with a gentleman, 46-year-old man with diabetes and hypertension. He had come up on as a high utilizer in diabetes. Um, and he had had regular primary care provider visits, but his chronic disease was really poorly controlled. Um, and, and so we made an outreach to him, um, and we developed a relationship with him. And as part of that, we screened him for everything that can affect their care, an individual's care. 
This includes social determinants, which is kind of like a, a, a look into your personal circumstances that can be a barrier. Um, and we found that he was with the year before. And then he was had an estranged uh, actually child uh, in the family. And so it had a, a tense relationship with the family, which was really affecting his overall well-being and his own self-management of his uh, disease state. So through building that relationship, um, which is based on trust, uh, we were able to find him a mental health provider who could actually see him in a timely manner, um, helped him to make and keep his appointments, and provided him kind of health ed education resources so he can better manage his own care. He was able to build, rebuild his family relationships, he had treatment for his depression, and his chronic disease was well controlled. Um, and yes, he has reconnected with his family, very thankful for our services. Um, this is just one of many examples. We get these routinely uh, testimonies uh, from, from our uh, members. One of the things that limits us is um, information, and we have made and will make technology investments um, to enhance our programs. Um, and starting in 2019, for example, uh, we're including real-time admission discharge and transfer information. Um, which, as you can imagine, the claim system has a delay of as much as 60 days before we're notified that something, something happened. This system would bypass that and, and actually give us immediate access. Um, lastly, I want to just talk about care management and kind of its impact on cost containment. It certainly improves, improves quality of care, improves access, um, but it also saves money. Um, what we found in our population is that Members who are identified for care management who are engaged versus those who are identified and for whatever reason don't engage are actually 25% less costly because we're able to navigate that system for patients, get them into the right care at the right place at the right time, um, and, and mitigate that cost at the same time as improving their experience. So utilization management, is that different from the two types of management you just discussed? Utilization management is a little part and parcel, but, um, and we've discussed this in, in kind of detailed response in uh, the binder in pages 247 and 248. Um, but basically what we're trying to do is guide members towards evidence-based proven therapies before the use of either ineffective or potentially investigational uh, where research is going on. Uh, therapies. Um, this is about not just waste, but harm and patient safety. Uh, and uh, we feel relatively strongly about that. Um, and so one of the ways we attempt to promote the use of these therapies is through administrative processes that you're familiar with, uh, medical pharmacy, radiology, appropriate use criteria, using national guidelines, in which essentially is what you might call prior approval process. Although that can be instituted in other innovative ways, which we're looking into. Um, Excuse me, Madam Heck, hearing examiner, I hate to do this, but I'm going to object. I think I've been patient. I know the board's been very patient. But what does all this have to do with th th this? This is a hearing on whether this rate increase meets the statutory standard. And I just don't understand the relevance of any of this. Well, the relevance is, uh, and I believe the HCA has asked these very questions, do, does Blue Cross promote quality care? Does Blue Cross promote access to care? Dr. Plavin is in charge of the very programs that promote quality and promote access. So, and he is almost done. <laughs> and, I, and I'm going to allow the questioning, and they're very much related to some of the questions that were asked by the HCA and by the board through this filing. You can proceed. I'll finish up. Thank you. I tend to. Um, <laughs> um, just a comment about the pharmacy and opioid epidemic through instituting guidelines and standards, we have seen a decrease in actually uh, close to 40% in opioid use in our population, which is really good. Um, and the prior approval process is streamlined and evolving. And so now over 50% of our prior approvals are automated, reducing burden, real, providing real-time approvals in an automated fashion. And we constantly evolve them. Um, 
Uh, and we retire policies and we have new policies and we work with our providers. So one of the uh, uh, one of the examples is the institution of a policy around prostatic urethral lift, which is a non-invasive treatment for prostatic enlargement as opposed to surgery. Um, this was brought forward by our providers. Better care, better access, lower cost, um, and we've instituted that policy. So in summary, we have uh, smart and targeted care management for our, uh, for our members. We focus on evidence-based utilization, monitoring, and management, and evolve that over time. And uh, we often implement programs with our uh, provider partners, including the ACO, to maximize resources, preventing duplication, preventing duplication, and collaborating, uh, magnifying all of our strengths. Thank you. As it's just about 11.30, I am going to give a very short break, um, and I think it's for the benefit of the witnesses and those who are looking at me anxiously out there. Um, 10 minutes, and we'll be back in the room at 20 till, and we will proceed with these witnesses and the questioning from the ACA.